Today on America's Test Kitchen, Julia cooks Bridget a hearty beef and vegetable stew. Adam shares his top pick for glass baking dishes. Dan reveals the science behind sound and flavor. And Bridget shows Julia a delicious recipe for cod baked in foil. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Bridget, I'm going to make you one of my favorite stews of all time. And I love stew in any form. I love burgundy. I love carbonade. I love the Portuguese alcatra. Mm -hmm. This is my number one. It's a stew Julia <laughs> style. It right? is. All right. So starting with the beef, you'll notice this is a lot less beef than we usually use when sure we make stew. This is just two pounds of chuck. And of course, that comes from the shoulder, which is perfect for making stew. We're just going to cut it up into big stew-sized pieces that measure about an inch and a half. I'm just gonna cut this right in half, and I'm gonna cut it down into nice big chunks. And as I go, you can get at any of those big lumps of fat and get them out. Especially the real hard fat needs that, to go. That's yeah. it. Now you don't have to get rid of it all. A little bit goes a long way in the pot, but you don't want it to be too greasy. Mm -hmm. You can actually go in there, and you can pull it away. Mm -hmm. That way you get all the meat without wasting any. It's a combination of pulling and cutting really gets you the most yield. Nice big stew-sized pieces. If you start with already tiny pieces, you're going to end up, well, with burger meat at the end. <laughs> it does really shrink as it cooks. Here we have our stew meat. Now I'm just going to pat it dry because we are going to brown it, and moist meat doesn't brown as well as dried meat. All so right. simple pat with some paper towels. I have just a teaspoon of vegetable oil in that Dutch All oven. Right. Heat it over medium-high heat. Medium We're high. looking for it to just be smoking. That way we can start browning the beef. Sounds good. Now I'm just going to season it with some salt and pepper. All right, so that meat is all nicely seasoned. And of course, we're gonna brown this in two batches. That way, there's a lot of room in the pot for all the pieces to get nice and browned and to develop some good fond. Okay. So I see wisps of smoke starting to happen. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm just gonna add half the meat. Oh, the sizzle of meat in a hot pot. There we go, that's about half. And we're gonna brown these, and it can take anywhere from five to 10 minutes to make sure they're nicely browned on all sides. All right. So we'll do this first batch, take it out, and then do the second. Sounds good. Ooh, look at that second batch. Beautifully browned beef and a beautifully browned pan, I might add as well, that yeah. gorgeous fond on the bottom. Heat when you're making a stew like this. Sure is. Turn the heat off for just a minute. Now it's time to talk vegetables. And I warned you, this is half vegetable stew, half beef stew. My I, favorite kind. I think it might be a quarter beef stew. I'm looking <laughs> at your garden that you just harvested there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All these are going into the stew. We're gonna start by adding the portobello mushroom. It adds good flavor, it has umami, mm -hmm. which enriches that beef sauce. Now, very often, we remove these gills for some stews because they can make things taste a bit muddy and overwhelming if you use a lot of mushrooms. Sure. But today, we're just using one big old cap, so we're going to leave them in because Great. they'll add good color and flavor. Fantastic. We're just going to cut this up into half-inch pieces. Of course, I washed this mushroom earlier, so it's free of grit. Good aroma from the mushroom. Mm-hmm. Into the pot we go. And there's a secret about mushrooms. They contain a ton of water. And so what we want to do is start this over medium heat. And this is just using the fat left in the pot from browning the beef. Okay. We're going to put the lid on and let those mushrooms sweat. Let those liquids come out of the mushrooms. And that's going to help deglaze that fawn mm. so it doesn't burn. So good. And that's going to take about five, 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's talk more vegetables. Starting with one of my favorites, good old kale. I love kale. For me, this is classic. So to prep the kale, we're gonna take off the woody stem, and you just do that with your fingers. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna cut the leaves crosswise into half-inch slices, and they'll continue to break down so you get some smaller bits and some longer pieces, and that's perfect for our stew. So this was a whole half a pound of kale, and it's half a pound when you buy it. It obviously weighs less <laughs> after you prep it and get rid of those heavy stems because it is often very gritty. Cut it first and then you wash it because then you have more surface area for the water really to get in there and get that dirt out. So I'm gonna go wash this in a salad spinner. If you wouldn't mind helping me finish prepping some of these vegetables, okay. we're gonna have some parsnips. We're just gonna cut it in half lengthwise and then cut it crosswise into one inch pieces. Our vegetables are ready to go. Let's take a look at these mushrooms in the pot. Ooh, looking good, beautiful color. Mm -hmm. It's time to cook with the lid off, let the mushrooms brown, which can take five to 10 minutes. Okay. All right, you can see all of that liquid has evaporated. And also notice it's a fresh pot of fond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and every time you scrape up and remake fond, you build more flavor. So that's a key here. It is true. All right, so in goes just a little more oil. This is a tablespoon of vegetable oil. 
Now we add the onions. And this isn't one onion, it's two onions. So in go the onions. Cook this meal for five to seven minutes here until they start to soften and turn lightly golden on the edges. Oh, those onions smell good. Incredible. Time to add some more flavor. Three cloves of minced garlic. And we're gonna add a lot of thyme. This is a tablespoon of fresh thyme. I'm just gonna cook this for about 30 seconds to bloom the garlic. Oh, that smells good. We're gonna add a little bit of flour. Now this is three tablespoons of all-purpose flour. And this will mix with any of the fat in the pot to make a roux, so it'll be the thickener. Also gonna add a tablespoon of tomato paste. I'm just gonna scrape this all around to make sure there's no dried bits of flour anymore. It's really gonna suck up any of the fat in there. And then that flour is gonna toast a little bit and that adds flavor again. Next goes in, not just a little red wine, a lot of red wine. So this is a cup and a half. I'm gonna add it slowly and I'm gonna whisk because now we're gonna be dissolving all that flour. And when you cook with red wine, I prefer to use a blend. It has a more even flavor once it reduces down. This is two cups of beef broth. And now I'm gonna add two cups of chicken broth. Now I know it sounds fussy to use two kinds of broth. It really adds a more balanced flavor. I'm just whisking this in, making sure there's no lumps of flour left. Just two bay leaves, make the world go round. You really do miss them when they're not in the pot. It's true. Now I'm gonna add our browned beef and any of the juices that have accumulated in the bottom of the bowl. And then we're just gonna bring this to a simmer, put the lid on, and we're gonna cook it in the oven, a 300 degree oven, which is our preferred method for braising because it really prevents any scorching from happening on the bottom of the pot because the heat's all over. Exactly. And it's gonna take about an hour and a half before we start adding the vegetables. Okay. Ooh, there you go. Thank you very much. Good smells coming from the oven. It's been in there for an hour and a half. <laughs> so the meat is not tender yet, but you can see the texture of that sauce is starting to thicken and deepen a bit. All right, so in goes some of the vegetables. Obviously, we didn't put them in at the beginning because then they would turn mushy, which is the fault with a lot of beef stew recipes, I see. But we're only gonna add the hearty vegetables at this stage. Okay. So we're gonna add the four parsnips, four carrots, and last but not least, 12 ounces of red potatoes. Again, we cut them up into one inch pieces. We're gonna stir these in, and now they get to braise in that beefy mm. liquid, and that'll take about an hour. All right. So back into the oven it goes. All right, let me get the door. Thank you. Now this stew is almost done. It only has 10 minutes left to go. All right. Perfect time to add our kale. One thing you want to do is make sure to really stir it in there so it's submerged. It's wilting right now. Mm-hmm, doesn't take much. All right, so back in for the last 10 minutes. Oh. To me, this is what stew should look like. All these vegetables with the bits of meat poking through. I'm gonna go on the bay leaf watch here. Ah, oh, two. All right, so now we're gonna add our last vegetable, peas. This is half a cup of frozen peas. No need to thaw them. In fact, they're gonna help the stew cool down so we can eat it faster. Just gonna stir these in so they can begin mm. to thaw. Mm. I'm also gonna sprinkle with a little parsley. Quarter cup of parsley. I'm gonna sprinkle it over the top. We'll stir it in just before serving. All right. Put the lid on, let those peas thaw, let the parsley bloom, and we'll be back. We can eat it. All right, I've made you wait long enough. Five minutes. It was hours. <laughs> it felt like hours, right? <laughs> oh. I'm just gonna portion you up a nice big bowl. Just take what you need and I'll eat out of the Dutch <laughs> oven, all right? I love the bits of really bright green in there too. Stunning. Mm. Falling apart. Perfectly cooked meat, perfectly cooked vegetables, and a gravy with real flavor. There's a beautiful red wine flavor in there, but it's so balanced. The portobello's really added tons of flavor in there, as did the tomato paste. I love that you added garlic. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> this might be the heartiest, best stew I've ever had. Thank you, Julia. Now to make this satisfying savory stew, it starts by browning chuck roast in two batches, then mushrooms and onions. Add wine, both chicken and beef broth, and simmer in the oven. Stir in potatoes, carrots, and parsnips. Stew an hour or more, then add kale, and finish with peas and parsley. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a hearty, stick to your ribs, beef stew Julia style, it's hearty beef and vegetable stew. You got it. <laughs>
Glass baking dishes have been going in and out of American ovens since about 1915. Luckily, Adam's here to tell us about one such dish, the rectangular baking dish. He's going to tell us which one to buy and how we should use it. You know, Bridget, if you are a casserole fiend like I am, <laughs> these are one of your kitchen best friends. I am casserole fluent. Oh man, these are three quart, 13 by nine glass baking dishes. Mm -hmm. They are the go-to baking dish for casseroles, lasagnas, cobblers, crumbles. Sure. And they also work really well for sheet cakes, like a yellow sheet cake where you want the crust to be a little bit lighter because the glass doesn't absorb heat as readily as the metal does. Right. So we have our lineup of five different glass rectangular baking dishes. The price range was $7.29 up to $18.77. Right. And the tests were lasagna and that yellow sheet cake that I was telling you about. And you know what? We don't get to say this all that often, but this is the feel good segment you cannot not go wrong Love with it. any of these pans. That's great news. The, both the lasagna and the cake out of all these pans was terrific. There was also a little bit of abuse testing. The testers cut lasagnas and cakes mm -hmm. right in the pans. They all survived, great. not a mark, right. no problem. So it got down to ease of use. Mm -hmm. And three guesses what ease of use got down to? First guess, handle. The handle, right? exactly. Biggest handles were the winner. You want to have a nice, sure grip as you're pulling, say, a hot lasagna out of the oven. And the biggest handles were the biggest help in that department. And I want you to experience it for yourself. We have a nice hot lasagna for you there. All right. And that's our winning pan. These are pretty bulky kitchen towels, yeah. so I'm going to pick it up. Yeah, if these handles were any smaller, the towels could be going into the food. I think about things like cobbler that are bubbling. You don't want to have your thumb dipping into a cobbler. That's and that, it's exactly right. This is the Pyrex Easy Grab three quart oblong baking dish. Nice big beefy handles, small price, $7.29. That's it. That's it. Wow, you can buy quite a few of those so you can make lots and lots of casseroles. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> well, if you like to bake a few casseroles or maybe even eat them, well, then go out and buy the winners. The Pyrex Easy Grab three quart oblong baking dish, and it retails for $7.29. Today, I've brought in our tasting expert, Jack Bishop, to help me with a really special experiment. We're gonna taste some chocolate, and you are the chocolate tasting expert. But first, I wanna know what kind of music you like to listen to. All right, this already felt like a setup, and now you're asking me about my music taste? No, no, no I'm just curious. Uh, salsa. Uh-huh. So I have two millennial daughters, so I actually have listened to a lot of rap. Okay. You know, you probably weren't, didn't see that coming. No, yet. I didn't, no, no, that's a surprise uh, to me. And I listen to a lot of, like, vocalist alternative music. How's okay. that sound? That like? sounds great. Well, so all, those are all really good music styles. We're not going to listen to any of those today, but we are actually going to listen to some music while we taste this chocolate. So okay. what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you try sample A, we'll play a track, and then sample B, and we'll play a track. Really paying attention to the sweetness, the bitterness, how it melts, all that good stuff. Okay. All right, let's go with sample one here, and we'll play the first track. It's chocolate. <laughs> it's good chocolate. It's good chocolate. It's a bittersweet chocolate, mm -hmm. which I like. Some espresso notes, some roasted notes. It melted fairly nicely. It would be something I would eat more of. All right, well, you might, you might get a chance to go back to it, but first we're gonna jump over to sample B here. We're gonna play a different track. Okay. So what did you think of sample B? I thought it melted very nicely. Mm -hmm. So it was actually very similar A and B. They were high quality chocolates in the sense there was no grittiness. This one seemed more like a, what I would call a hipster chocolate. <laughs> it was actually too bitter for me. For me, the sweet spot is somewhere around like 60% cacao yep. when it comes to eating chocolates and those like 70% cacao sort of lower sugar chocolates. I don't know. It's they're like a little too much. They're a little too much. So Jack, what if I told you that they're actually the exact same chocolate? Would you believe me? I believe you're trying to trick me. Um... <laughs> so I am trying to trick you a little bit, but it actually has nothing to do with the chocolate. They are the exact same bar. They're both our winning Ghirardelli 60% cacao bar. The only difference was the music that we listened to. Okay, tell me about that music, because neither of the tracks were very good. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the interesting thing. We all know that it's about 80% of flavor is made up of scent. That's something that I learned from you. But did you know that the sound around you can contribute to the flavor of something as well? The sound around you influences how you perceive the food that you eat. Higher pitch music, like that first sample, can make food taste sweeter, while lower pitch music, like the second sample, can actually make it taste more sour or bitter. So the big takeaway here is like, 
pay attention to what you're playing at your dinner party. All right, so I should be like having up-tempo, happy music when I'm eating chocolate? When you're eating dessert, maybe? You want it to be a little bit sweeter? Exactly. So we've actually posted the music on americastestkitchen.com, and you can do this experiment right at home. Thanks so much, Jack. Thank you, Dan. All right, Julia, I've got a treat for you. This is something that I make all the time. I actually make it for my family, but it's also nice enough to make when company comes over. Mm -hmm. It's cod baked in foil. Mm, I love cod. I do too. Everybody loves cod. Beautiful, light, flaky fish. That's why we like it. And this is something that comes together quickly. It actually creates its own sauce right in the package. Simple to put together. Let's get over to the fish. Mm, beautiful cod. These are about six ounces each. Nice center cut fillets. And they're about one to one and a half inches thick. That's what you want to look for. You don't want to get skinnier fillets because they're going to overcook before our vegetables are done. Makes sense. Now you can also use halibut or something like a red snapper. That would be perfect here. But cod is abundant, so we're going with that. We do have some prep to get together before we put together our little packets. All right. A little veg prep. I'm going to do some, but you're over here. So you're going to do something. <laughs> you're going to put me to work. Is this what your dinner parties are like? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to cook vegetables along with the fish. Now we like really delicate flavored vegetables so they don't overpower the cod. And this is two options, leeks and carrot. Mm. I'm going to do the leek. You're going to do the carrot. All right. So we're using two leeks in total, just the whites and the light green part here. I'm going to get rid of these. And in order for this to work, I'm going to cut these into matchsticks. So I just cut it in half lengthwise, just start to take a few layers apart. I love doing that. And I actually cut these in half again, just so that they fit nicely into the packet. And then I'll start cutting across. Now you'll start to see some dirt there. Yep, that's okay because we are going to clean them. I'm going to do the same here. All right, so that's good enough. If you wouldn't mind cutting this also into matchsticks, we have a second carrot right oh, here. Oh, you have a sample of what I need to do. I do. Cut these just like that first one. You got it. Now, I don't know mine. They're a little bit more rustic. Yeah, well, it's just a matchstick of a giant person. <laughs> All right, so we're going to combine these two together, season these with some salt and pepper. We're going to season all of our ingredients before they go into the foil, and then that way, we know that once it comes out, well seasoned. We're done with that for just a second. Now, step two. Butter. Butter, yes. Butter makes everything better, and in this case, it's the base for a compound butter that's going to create a beautiful sauce in our little packets as they bake. So this is four tablespoons of unsalted butter, nice and soft, a quarter teaspoon of grated lemon zest, these are all light flavors going with the fish. A teaspoon of minced garlic. We have a teaspoon of finely minced fresh thyme. A quarter teaspoon of table salt and an eighth of a teaspoon of black pepper. Mmm. So I'll just mush this together to make a nice compound butter. That would taste good on a lot of things. <laughs> it would. I'll leave that up there just for a moment. So let's move on down to our fish. All we need to do at this point is pat them dry with paper towels. They really have a lot of moisture inside, so we just don't want any excess moisture. Same reason that we dried off those leeks. Now, more salt and pepper. We've got our fish ready, our vegetables ready, compound butter ready. It's origami time. We are going to make four packets. These are 12 inch squares of aluminum foil. First thing I want to do is divide the vegetables amongst these four, and I love to build all four at a time. It's much easier to make sure it's all even. That's looking good, there we go. Got a little measuring cup there. This is just dry vermouth. We're going to add this on top of the vegetables. It's going to create a little bit of steam in there. Plus, it's got a beautiful herbal flavor to it, so it's going to help make a great sauce. Mm. You could also use white wine with this. I've done it where I've used fennel instead of leeks Ooh. and used Pernod instead. So Ooh, that sounds nice. This is a great opportunity to try a little different thing. So I'm going to add a tablespoon to each, just right on top of the vegetables. The vegetables are like a thatch. They just catch that liquid and prevent it from running all over. Fillets go right on top of the vegetables. A little leek and carrot hammock there. And now I'm going to dollop the butter right on top of the fish. I'll start off with a spoonful on each, doing my best to kind of divvy it first before I spread them out. Now I'll just use the back of my spoon to kind of spread it out. Doesn't matter if it's not totally covered, all going to be good. Again, good enough. We're going to put another piece of foil on top. If we tried to just bring these edges up and make this a single packet, there are too many places for air to escape. We want a steamy, airtight package here. All right. Another piece of 12-inch foil. 
There you go. Cool bean, Coach. Start at the bottom. I'm gonna do about a half inch fold. All right. All right, you're gonna do that a couple more times. We're looking to make a seven inch packet and then just continue with the other sides. Now, how far in advance can you make these packets? I actually make them a couple hours in advance. I keep them in the fridge exactly like this. And then when people come over, just stick them in the oven. And you don't even have to increase the cooking time? Not one bit. All right, how's that look? That looks pretty darn good. There's a rimmed baking sheet down there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna put these on and it's okay if they overlap a bit. It's really just the ends. It's like that, great. So we're gonna put these in a really hot oven, 450 degrees. We need that blast of super high heat to get that steaming process started. They're only gonna stay in there for 15 minutes. Now I've got the rack set to the medium low position and that's actually really important for these. We want that heat source to be close to the bottom of these packets so it really concentrates the juices and makes an even better sauce. All right, so there's no visual cue. 15 minutes I love is it. 15 minutes. This really is easy. Foolproof. All right, it's been 15 minutes. Mm, you start to smell a little bit of that garlic and you the lemon. Do. So they're done. Blind faith. We know that through our testing, 15 minutes is perfect. The vegetables are going to be cooked through and the cod is not overcooked. Amazing. Right. Make ahead one dish and it only takes 15 minutes. And now, just going to go ahead and pop open the top. Now I want to open this away from me so as the steam comes out, I'm not getting burned. Mm. Just want to get in a very thin spatula like this to get underneath the fish and as many of those vegetables as I can. There we go. Ooh. All right, and now all these juices, not going to waste, all over the top. Oh, hello. How is that? We can move those up there. Okay. Just have one final little addition. It's a little gremolata. Ooh. More of those same flavors that we put inside, but starting, of course, with two tablespoons of minced fresh parsley, another teaspoon of grated lemon zest, another teaspoon of minced garlic. Just mix this together right at the last second so that parsley stays beautiful and green. Let me make this pretty since those are so beautiful. All right, so there we go. Now at table, you can pass this around. People can add as much as they like. Just a little sprinkling. Oh, that does look really pretty. It's just gonna hit the heat and a little bit of that freshness right at the end. Mm. Livens things up. There's lemon if you'd like it. Oh, the fish, it really is perfectly cooked. I mean, look at that. Just flakes apart. 15 minutes. Yep, but not overdone. It's still nice and juicy. Oh. Mmm. It's so light and fresh, and you saw how easy it was. The vermouth and the fish juices and that butter, it's delicious on the vegetables. This is amazing. You can come over anytime. <laughs> so if you want to make Bridget's famous fish dinner, start by julienning some leeks and carrots and make a compound butter with lemon and thyme. Layer the vegetables, vermouth, fish, and butter inside a tightly crimped foil packet and bake in a 450 degree oven for just 15 minutes. Sprinkle with a quick parsley and lemon gremolata and you're cooking. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a great new recipe for cod baked in foil with leeks and carrots. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.